are not only at the fireside, but in the councils of the nation. Then, and not only until then, will there be the perfect comradeship, the ideal union between the sexes that shall result in the highest development of the race. Amen to that. Email me yours at the story at foxnews.com with your name and your town. Thanks for joining us tonight. That's the story. Tucker is up next. Well, good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Believe it or not, it was a year ago today that BuzzFeed released the now infamous Trump dossier. And now a year later, they are being sued for defamation by the president's lawyer. Editor-in-chief Ben Smith of BuzzFeed News will join us later in the show to defend his decision to publish that dossier. But first tonight, President Trump has suggested, he did yesterday, that he's willing to sign any deal on DACA that Congress is able to hammer out. Well, an actual deal does at this point seem a long way off, but maybe getting a little closer. Today, House Republicans outlined a bill that would allow DACA beneficiaries to remain in the United States. Critically, though, it would deny them a path to citizenship. Democrats don't seem in favor of it. They know, of course, that amnesty for illegal immigrants is crucial to their own electoral strategy of importing a new class of voters from abroad. Democratic Congressman from Texas, Beto O'Rourke, represents the border city of El Paso. He's seeking the Democratic nomination to challenge Senator Ted Cruz this fall. O'Rourke has sponsored legislation that would provide illegal immigrants with taxpayer-funded health care and free legal assistance to fight deportation. Congressman O'Rourke joins us tonight. Congressman, thanks a lot for coming on. Thanks for having me. So if you're watching at home, if you're a voter watching this debate, here you have the Republicans conceding that DACA recipients can stay in the country. They're not going to be deported. And you have Democrats responding by saying, no, that's not enough. We want to make sure that they can vote and bring their relatives over also. So can you understand how some people watching that might conclude that Democrats are spending more time and energy worrying about people here illegally than about American citizens? I guess I don't make the connection, Tucker. Um, I think that most Americans, most Texans, certainly those that I've listened to across the state, want to make sure that dreamers can continue to remain and thrive in their communities. You have people like Saba Nafriz, who I just met, who's a PhD student in mathematical biology in Texas Tech. She's a dreamer. You have people like Alonzo Guillen, who died trying to rescue his fellow Texans during the, uh, the flooding after Harvey. He was a dreamer from Lufkin, Texas. I was in Booker, right. as Republican as it gets in Texas, and the people in Booker were concerned about dreamers because they had just deported one of the honor roll students okay. at Booker okay. High School. I'm, they I'm want sorry. To see them I, 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 hold on. So, hold country. on. Just stop your speech really quick. There are a lot of good dreamers for sure. There are also a lot of bad ones. More dreamers have been busted for gang membership than have joined the military. I'm not, you know, that's not an indictment of all people here under DACA. It's just, let's just get real. These are normal people, some good, some bad. They're not all valedictorians. But the question is, there are a lot of good American citizens as well. And can you see why when Democrats say we're not going to fund the government unless you allow these people to vote and bring their relatives with them, that maybe it suggests a priority that's out of sync with those of most people here? That's my only question. Yeah, I, I guess I don't see that. I, I'll tell you, from my perspective in El Paso, Texas, the city that I represent, where I'm raising my three kids who are 11, 9, and 7, um, I, I want to make sure that our com community continues to thrive. And one of the reasons that we are one of the safest cities in America every single year for the last 20 years is we are a city of immigrants, including dreamers, who contribute to our success and our safety. And that benefit uh, is spread out over everybody in my community throughout the state of Texas and to this country. So it's very good for America, not just for dreamers, not just for their families. So I think most what, Americans wait, hold see on. this wait, as wait, wait, a let me net say, benefit. Right. I just checked the school numbers in El Paso, the city that you're bragging about. And I, El Paso is a great city. But 39 percent, only 39 percent of graduating seniors from your schools are ready for college in math or English. It seems like maybe that's a bigger crisis than whether or not people here legally can bring their relatives from abroad. Wouldn't you think? I mean, again, priorities. Yeah, I don't think working on these things is mutually exclusive. You'll, you'll find okay. no one who's worked harder or done more, for example, for veterans in this country when it comes to mental health care access. That's a very sacred priority of mine. I've been able to make progress with Republican members on this issue. At yeah. the same time, I can advocate for the success of my community and our country at large by ensuring that those dreamers stay here. By anyone's measure, there's extraordinary positive economic benefit to those dreamers staying here, the jobs that are created, the, the dollars no, that are that's, spent that's, in this community. I'm, I'm sorry, that's not, you don't have the numbers on that. You can't prove that. I absolutely you spend a lot do. of time on this question. You, you don't, actually, because this has been looked at a lot. 
And there's no evidence that bringing people who have lower than average educational attainment as they do into this country in a high-tech economy makes the rest of us richer. There's just not evidence for that. Yeah. Well, economists have looked at this, and it's measured not in the millions, but in the tens of billions right. of dollars okay. to the positive right. that okay. dreamers bring to our economy. The, so let that, me ask you that's this. Good that's, for all I of mean, us. it's the, a lot of these are minors. These are extrapolations and theoretical. I hope you'll concede that at least. But let me ask you this. Why is it good for Americans? Why should Americans pay for legal representation for pe people here illegally? You sneak in, taxpayers pay for your lawyer, you sponsor legislation that would allow that. How does that benefit Americans exactly? I think it's keeping true to who we are. When you have asylum seekers from the most violent, brutal countries in the world, like El Salvador, uh, who are young kids or young families, uh, I want to make sure that they have every opportunity to apply for uh, asylum in this country, knowing the laws, having an advocate, and aren't returned to a country where they face, in some cases, certain death. Um, but so these are people, just to be clear, they came here illegally. They didn't, they, they, they didn't come as refugees through one of our many programs to bring refugees here. Very they often they in. came as asylum seekers who presented themselves to Border Patrol agents at the border, to customs officers at the ports of entry. And so actually, then taxpayers are paying for them to fight American law in court? I mean, can you see why not, people Not to say, fight well, American wait, law, actually yeah. to get right with American law, to make sure that they show up to their court hearings, to make sure that uh -huh. they follow our laws. I think, I think, again, that's in everyone's interest. But if you're concerned about security... For us to pay for lawyers so they can fight deportation, that's somehow good for us. Why is it good for us to pay for the health care bills of people who snuck in here against our law? Why did you sponsor legislation that would have allowed that, too? It's good for people who are in our country, who are contributing to this country's success, to be uh, safe, to be healthy, to be able to continue to contribute. Um, did the again, law specify, did your bill specify it only applied to people who were benefiting our country? I don't think it did. I think it was anybody here illegally would get free health care at taxpayer expense. I, I, I'm sorry, with all respect, I'm confused by why we should pay for the health care of someone who broke our law to get here. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, I, I don't think you're reading the, the, the bill correctly. Um, I think and, I am. And I think, I think you're losing sight of the benefit that we gain by those who are contributing to our communities, our states, and our country's success. Did that um, law specify that only people contributing to our country would get free health care, or did it also apply to, I don't know, gang members or vagrants? I think they were covered too, weren't they? I, I think there's an interest in making sure that if someone is going to be sick, um, if someone needs help, that we deliver it in the most efficient, effective, uh, cost-effective way possible. Oh, so, so it's cost-effective to pay for the health care of people here. Yeah, I mean, you, you can pay for it in the emergency room. Uh, How about not at, paying for it at all? Yeah. Well, then you can watch people die uh, in, in, your, in your community oh, and in your yeah, country. Yeah, I must be a mean person for not being in favor. Congressman, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks House for Republicans, me. led by Bob Goodlatte of Virginia, have released an outline for what they say a DACA deal ought to look like. It includes mandatory E-Verify, an end to the diversity lottery, authorization for a wall, and more. Congressman Raul Labrador is a Republican representing the state of Idaho, and he joins us tonight. Congressman, thanks for coming on. It's great to be on your show. So I, you're on the inside of the Congress, obviously. I'm far outside. But we spoke to someone close to leadership today who said he didn't believe that Republicans were at the number they needed to be to get this done. Do you think that's true? Well, I, I think it's fascinating that the Speaker of the House introduced tax legislation without 218 votes. He introduced right. a health care bill without 218 votes. But all of a sudden, he's requiring Republicans, conservative Republicans in the House, to have 218 votes before they introduce DACA <laughs> and border security legislation. Do you think that's fair? <laughs> no, I think, it's, I think it's, it's very telling, actually. Why do you think, and I didn't know that, why do you think that is? Because I think they have a different agenda in the leadership, and I think we're trying to show them that our Republican conservative bill is the only one that's going to get the majority of the conference together. In fact, I believe that after we educate the conference, we talk about this bill, we, inter we explain to people what is in this bill, that we're going to have over 218 Republicans approve and sponsor this bill. I think we can do this. But I think they should put the same effort that they put into health care and that they put into the tax bill into making sure that we secure our borders, that we end the diversity visa program, that we end chain migration, just like the American people told President Trump and supported President Trump by the millions and the millions, and he became president of the United States. What do you suppose the argument from within 
the Republican side of Congress would be against those measures, ending chain migration, ending the diversity lottery, E-Verify. What would be the argument against that? So they don't have an argument against that bill. What they have an argument is that they say that if it goes to the Senate, the Senate is not going to pass it. And that shouldn't be our responsibility as members of the House. Our members of the House, our job is to present the best solution to the American people and the most conservative solution to the American people. Let the Senate handle what they're going to do in the Senate. We can handle what we're going to do in the House. We do not need to do a DACA bill. And some people in our leadership believe that that is a priority of the Republican conference. It shouldn't be. The priority of the Republican conference is to secure the border, to end chain migration, to, to do the, all the different things that we told the American people we're going to do over the last eight years when we were right. asking for a majority in the House, a majority in the Senate, and, and the presidency. Do you think, I mean, you've made this point by implication, but do you think your leadership in the House understood the lessons of the last presidential election? I'm not sure leadership in the House ever understands the lessons of the, of the last election, ever. They always look forward as, as to how they can manage the next week or the next month. What they need to understand is that the American people sent a really clear message. They gave President Trump the presidency because they wanted him to secure the borders. That was the number yes. one issue, as what? you know. That, that he talked about throughout his election. He defeated 16 other Republicans, very, very articulate, very, very strong Republicans, because that was the number one issue that he campaigned on. That's what the American people want, and that's what we should deliver as Republicans. I think that's a pretty clear rationale. Congressman, thanks a lot for that. I appreciate your candor. It's great to be on the show. President Trump's lawyer just sued BuzzFeed.com for releasing the now infamous Trump dossier a year ago today. Editor-in-chief of BuzzFeed News, Buzz Smith, Ben Smith, will provide his company's response to that suit next. Well, exactly one year ago tonight, BuzzFeed released the Trump dossier to the public, even though they couldn't verify any of its contents, some of which were scandalous and salacious. We blasted for them at the time. Now they're getting sued. President Trump's attorney, Michael Cohen, has sued both BuzzFeed and dossier creator Fusion GPS, the oppo firm, saying the document defames the president by baselessly linking him to Russia conspiracy theories. BuzzFeed editor-in-chief Ben Smith came on the show to defend the dossier's release a year ago and is game enough to join us once again. Ben, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me on, Tucker. So you've been sued by the president's lawyer. What's your response? Well, I think it's very much what I told you this time last year. The dossier itself is, the, is a document of kind of obvious central public importance. It's the subject of, of multiple investigations by intelligence agencies, by Congress, that was clear a year ago. It's actually a lot clearer now that before you know before we that before we published it, as, as we knew then, important elected officials, intelligence agencies were investigating this document. When we talked last time, that was a subject of some dispute, and a lot of people. I'm not sure if you said this, but a lot of people on the right said, you know, this is an irrelevant nonsense document. Now, what I see on Fox News in particular is that this document was central, arguably too central to the FBI investigation. I think that's clearly established now. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, you're absolutely right. It, it was central. It looks that, I mean, to the extent we know, and there's a lot we don't know about its role in this investigation, but it sure seems like that's right. But then you've been doing this for a long time, and you know that all kinds of, in effect, dossiers come across the desks of investigators and intel agencies, law enforcement agencies, and, and politicians, and people who cover them. And they're not made public because their contents are unverified, sometimes unverifiable, and they're defamatory. And so, you know, you see a lot of stuff that you don't pass on because you don't know if it's true. And the words hang in the air. You libel someone, in effect. So you don't run it. But you did run this because it was Trump. Your inbox and mine, as you say, are full of all sorts of would-be dossiers, of tips, yeah, of, of exactly. allegations, of claims. They, they are not full of documents that are being briefed to the President of the United States, to the President-elect of the United States, being fought over in an intense tug-of-war by intelligence officials that, you know, for instance, imagine covering the week that we just had, right? Imagine covering the Simpsons testimony to the Intelligence Committee, the battle between Feinstein and Grassley, in a situation in which you were not allowed to 
in which you had no idea what they were fighting about. I mean, I just think that it's hard that Americans would have a lot of trouble understanding right. the I mean, last right. year of course, without this of course. document. But you're making a retroactive argument. I mean, I guess no, this I was, was arguing this was this was no, true no, no, at the time. No, the dossier no, was a piece of dark matter that was pulling the FBI, that, that was pulling Harry Reid. And but that's it's important to understand no, what these no, guys are the doing. Point. That's the point, is that we now have the context for it, and we didn't then. We, a and lot so of this was, we knew then. A lot of, a lot no, of well, the it, it wasn't. reality I didn't read of the it stakes on, we knew I didn't then. read it on BuzzFeed. I didn't know this was part of a Hillary Clinton oppo operation that she took up from a Republican, anti-Trump Republican donor operation. We didn't know the extent to which Steele apparently had gotten some of this information from Russian intelligence and shady Russian sources. There's a lot we didn't know. I mean, I think and the description, the characterizations of Steele's sources are actually in the dossier. But, the, you, but it's true. There's been a ton of subsequent reporting. So, I guess here's the point. So you're arguing, well, okay, it's at the center of the news, so we were right a year ago to run it. And I'm actually not even attacking you for running it. I would just like you to acknowledge that partisanship played a role. So, That's for example, just, you know, that is just not true. If we were in the oh, exact same on. situation with a president Hillary Clinton, we would have run that dossier at the same. Really? I mean, so, if you I can't prove that to you, but okay, you know, no, but you, for you, instance, you for instance, there was well, a day well, last me, year. Okay. There was a day last year. It was a, and it was not the biggest story of the day because because it was the day of the Access Hollywood tape. But also on that day, we were the first to report on the substance of Hillary Clinton's speeches. Of her secret speeches, like, you know, I mean, I, we, I think that there's this well, perception. secret speeches to like Goldman or something. I mean, but, no, but that's not. Look, th this is different level I'm salacious. Sorry, you weren't okay? so interested in them once they came out, but I mean, I, they were pretty I, interesting. I was, uh, I was interested, but but they weren't claiming that she was into some weird sex practice with I mean, a foreign I don't, government I'm not sure either you or I in our okay. careers. This is obviously a very unusual No, we, we, have, we have actually. Hold on, we have. There was a lot of stuff floating around about Obama and his personal life and. And of course, the you know question where he was born, his birth certificate, and we sort of laugh about it now. But it was a big news story, and people were making allegations about, it, including now President Trump. If you came across a dossier in the middle of the Obama administration that laid out in some detail how he was born in Kenya and had a weird personal, life, you would never run that because if, I mean, you would if it be was being taken, if it was being taken seriously by the intelligence agencies, if it was being briefed to the president, absolutely. Well, if it was a Republican president, if look. If Trump were president at, I mean, it's all theoretical. I mean, we all but cover. I mean, Donald Trump made these ridiculous claims yeah, about I mean, the birth certificate, and we cover them. We didn't bleep them out. Okay, but if there was a detailed dossier on the subject that had been assembled by the political enemies I mean, of Barack Obama, unfortunately, the dossier was his. He was he was <laughs> smart enough to put all that stuff in a dossier that he published and sold in his memoir, as his memoir okay. in Obama's case. But that's a okay, different story. Okay, but uh, look, the truth is. This stuff was unverified a year ago. It remains unverified. I hope you will at least some elements, concede. Some elements of it actually have been corroborated since okay, then. Okay, but the big, the big stuff has not been. There's still no evidence. The, I think the payments to Manafort, which are and, and the Manafort indictment, are pretty big okay. stuff. But the, and we, are no, the, we are no closer to stuff. proving and that the he collaborated stuff. with the Russian government or that he's with, with hookers in a hotel room. I mean, that the, was the a, central, a character assassination, and it's still unproven. I mean, honestly. That, 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 is, that is unproven. The, yeah. The okay. broad outline of a Russian campaign to penetrate and influence the American election, I think, is it has been established. Yeah, well, that's been going on for 100 years. Ben, thank you. Thanks, Thanks. for having me, Tucker. President Trump tore into Senator Dianne Feinstein for releasing the closed-door testimony of Fusion GPS founder Glenn Simpson yesterday. The president tweeted this, the fact that sneaky Dianne Feinstein, who has on numerous occasions stated that collusion between Trump and Russia has not been found, would release testimony in such an underhanded and possibly illegal way without authorization is a disgrace, must have tough primary. Kim Strassel is a Wall Street Journal editorial board member, and she joins us tonight. Kim, thanks for coming on. Happy to be um, here, Tucker. So I'm, I'm, I, I must say, as I said last night, I'm, I'm grateful to Senator Feinstein for releasing this. I, I think the public has a right to know. I'm glad I, I'm glad I read it because I think there was interesting stuff in there. Did you think that, and did you learn anything from the release of, of this transcript that you didn't know? Well, first of all, I think transparency is an excellent idea, and I would love nothing more than for congressional Republicans to follow Senator Feinstein's lead exactly. and in an organized fashion and a considered fashion release everything related to the dossier so that exactly. Americans can finally make their own judgments. I have an issue with the way that Senator Feinstein did do this because 
the reason that the Senate has rules, Congress in general has rules about this, is because when you unilaterally release testimony, it's unfair to other witnesses. You basically have one person getting to make their case in public, and all the other people who might no, have a, differing views, they don't get their say. That's and a fair point. That's a problem. Also, it discourages other witnesses to come forward, like Jared Kushner. If the Democrats truly are interested in getting to the bottom of this question, he's an important witness. Now, why would he ever come forward in light of this voluntarily? And by the way, why would Senator Grassley ever agree to a subpoena for him, knowing that Senator Feinstein could turn around and unilaterally release his testimony as well, too? That's a fair point, though I don't think Jared Kushner would ever come voluntarily. He'd be foolish to do that because everything he said would be leaked. But in reading this, I was really struck by Simpson's claim that the Obama FBI, the FBI under the previous administration, told Steele, the investigator working for the Hillary campaign by proxy, dirt about the Trump campaign, that they may have been in collusion with the Russian government. I mean, is, is that allowed? That seems totally out of bounds for an FBI agent to do that. Well, it, it brings up a lot of questions, which was, did the FBI know that Steele was working for Simpson, who was working for the Clinton campaign? And if the FBI didn't know this, why hadn't it done its due diligence and asked Good what question. Steele's interest in this was? So then if you find out that they are passing along information, and by the way, it would seem that it did. Simpson originally claimed that he had information that the, the FBI had had a, an insider source within the Trump campaign. He later had to come out and clarify that wasn't true. He had essentially misled the committee and that he was just referring to all this other news about a, an Australian diplomat and George Papadopoulos. Okay, how did he find that out? How did he know that all the way the back last year? It seems the only way it could have got to him is that the FBI told Steele, Steele told Simpson. And by the way, did Simpson then tell the Clinton campaign? Was the Clinton campaign in possession of confidential FBI investigatory material about Mr. Trump during the election? I mean, I, I don't see how you couldn't reach that conclusion. He was being paid to gather information for the Clinton campaign. But I hope, I hope the Republicans take your wise advice and release everything they know so the rest of us can know. Kim, thanks a lot for that. Get it all out there. All of Get it. Get it all out there. <laughs> Amen. Well, tech giants like Google and Facebook are omnipresent in our lives and increasingly omnipotent as well. We'll ask Senator Mike Lee if it's time for Congress to take a look at the harm they could be causing to this country. Stay tuned. Apple, Google, Facebook, Twitter, they all have your private information. They can control not just what you see online, but what you're allowed to say, and maybe over time, what you are capable of thinking and believing. In many cases, their services are addictive and harmful, and they know that. It's increasingly clear that tech giants are not just a threat to privacy, they are a threat to our basic American freedoms. Well, for most people, there's not much you can do about it except get increasingly paranoid. Congress, though, can do a lot. It's Congress, after all. Republican Senator Mike Lee of Utah is the chairman of the Senate Subcommittee on Antitrust, Competition, Policy, and Consumer Rights. So if anybody could take action against the tech oligarchs, it is him. Senator Lee joins us tonight. Senator, thanks for coming on. Thank you very much. So there are a lot of ways to come at this story, but here's the bottom line from my perspective, and I think I speak for many. No company has ever been as powerful in the history of the world as Google is, and I would add to that Apple and Facebook. And it's now become really clear that they're misusing that power. So bottom line, they're too powerful and they're hurting people. Why wouldn't Congress step in to pare back that power? What we have to look at from the standpoint of antitrust law often centers on the concentration of market power, not just from the standpoint of what is too much, but from the standpoint of what is inflicting consumer harm. And something you mentioned last night that I feel the need to respond to about Google suddenly being more of a threat to people's privacy than the government. Uh, I disagree with that. That is not to say that at some point a company like Google couldn't become too powerful and inflict consumer harm. But it in no way is as much of a threat as the government to your privacy. 
Uh, Google doesn't have guns. It can't shoot you. It can't tax you. It can't regulate you the way that the government can. And so that's why my much bigger focus is on uh, the threat posed by the federal government to your privacy. By the way, Google has I, your email. It's one of your concerns with them. They've got your email. The government can get your email, whether it's yes. carried by Google or AOL or without anybody a warrant. else, yes, without right. a warrant. And, and that's I, incredibly I, I, disturbing. Of course, I, I, I am fearful of that, and I'm grateful for your work as a libertarian-infused conservative pushing back against that, which you have done. And all my life as a conservative, I've always assumed as a matter of faith that the government is the main threat. But I've come to believe that the threat from these com companies is more profound and certainly much more insidious. And there's no recourse. I can't vote out the head of Google if I want. It's a private company. But uh, here's that's true. The, here's the but single you can use a different search engine. You do have other options as a consumer. Well, actually, uh, you, you can't as a citizen. You can't just leave. The, you can leave the country. Most people consider that uh, a very dire, drastic remedy. Uh, but as a consumer, you can choose to use a different search engine, uh, use somebody else to handle your email. Uh, I, there are other market options available to but, you but, as but a see, consumer. Here's the thing. There's, look, we have with the government, and I'm not defending the government and its, its frequent overreach, which terrifies me. Of course, I spend most shows talking about it. But we have FOIA. I can find out what's going on. In the case of Google, which is the portal through which people understand reality increasingly, you don't know things if they're not on Google. Google has jiggered its search results to eliminate concepts that it disagrees with, political concepts. This is not a fever dream of mine. This is a fact which is proven. And if you don't believe it, play with Google for half an hour. They have changed the search results to disappear ideas they don't like. So right. why is that not terrifying to the prospect of running a democracy that requires an informed citizenry? I don't understand why that's not really scary. Okay, that's a, that's a fair question. Let's make one thing very clear, though. No one is compelling you to use Google. You, I understand you do have the libertarian other options. argument. And now, it is disturbing. I don't like it when they do that. I've raised this with Google executives time and time again. And I've made inquiries as the chairman of the antitrust subcommittee in the Senate uh, with regard to Google. Uh, but uh, as of right now, uh, Google, of course, is not a government entity. Gov Google is not a public utility. Uh, they are a private for-profit corporation, uh, one that can make decisions uh, as the corporation deems but, but, fit. But hold on. But Google controls the overwhelming majority of digital advertising along with Facebook, the overwhelming majority. So that means that every news organization that relies on digital advertising, which is all of them that aren't on television, that they're all dependent upon two companies that are wildly political and working against free speech. That's not a concern. That seems a concern to me. Yeah, and, and I'm not saying that that's not a concern. What I'm saying is that not every concern rises to the level of market concentration coupled with consumer harm. And, and I'm also saying that in this circumstance, we have options that consumers have access to. They can use other search engines. They can avoid Google if they want to, and that does make a difference here. All right. Senator, thank you for joining us. This is, I used to be a libertarian until Google. <laughs> thank you for coming on. Thank you. 95-year-old comic book legend Stan Lee, the man who created Spider-Man, is the latest victim of Hollywood sexual harassment and backlash. Has Me Too become a war on people who don't deserve to be hurt by it, including Stan Lee. That discussion is next. Well, the backlash against sexual harassment is broadening in scope for about the 15th time now, and it's now hitting Marvel Comics legend Stan Lee. He's 95 years old, and at that age, he needs nurses to care for him at his home, and now some of those nurses have accused him of groping them and asking for sexual favors. Sexual harassment is appalling, of course. On the other hand, this is a man who is already 50, was 50 years old when the term sexual harassment was first coined. Targeting a helpless elderly man like that does seem like preying on the weak, not protecting them. So what are we to make of this? Ashley Pratt is a contributor to U.S. News World Report, and she joins us tonight. Ashley, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Tucker. This is one of those rare cases where, I, and I don't know the truth of it, and I want to pretend that I do, but it wouldn't surprise me if it were true because the elderly, for a bunch of physical reasons, sometimes do say inappropriate things related to sex. I mean, they do. This is a, actually a well-known phenomenon, and I think most nurses who care for the elderly are very aware of this. So given that, it seems a little strange to hear charges against, this presented as charges against a guy when it's actually kind of common. 
Well, at the same time, though, we have to, you know, take this a little seriously and realize that when these allegations are coming out, there needs to be an investigative process to them. We can't just go out there defaming people. And I think that that's one of the biggest issues that I have currently with the Me Too movement. It's doing a lot of great things, but it's also allowing a platform for defamation to happen. And in this case, you know, if these allegations are true, then it should be brought in a legal suit, and then these should be examined for what they are. And if he was groping people and he was exposing himself and doing all of these things that they're alleging, then of course that is despicable behavior. But if in fact, you know, it's just jokes and whatnot, that we can we can determine what those you know issues are there but I'm I'm someone who I worked on a campaign with all men multiple times and I know jokes versus inappropriate behavior and right. I think we need to trust women in these instances and realize that we know what is right and we know what is wrong but in but these cases a, of defamation that is an issue what if there's a third explanation which and again I don't know the truth but having been around the elderly and I think anyone who has knows exactly what I'm talking about what if they're true, but a, a symptom of advanced age? This is not uncommon. So is there an age at which, maybe it's 95, where we say you're not fully responsible for the way you're behaving. You don't represent all men. Maybe you're just 95 years old and you do things you wouldn't have done when you were 75 or 55, right? right? But we, we can't make excuses for behavior. If he's exposing himself and asking for sexual favors, you know, and that right there is a problem. It's not just jokes. Like when they came out with the allegations against George H.W. Bush, that bothered me because those were jokes that were being made in front of his wife. Now, you can have an argument there whether or not he should be making them, but it's just jokes. In this situation, if he was actually exposing himself and groping women who were taking care of him, that is a problem that you can't blame on old age. If he's making jokes that they don't find tasteful. But you can blame tasteful, it on him. But that's the thing. That's what I'm saying. I, I don't think saying. we can Sometimes blame exposing can blame on oneself. Age. That is a behavioral issue that we should not tolerate as women or as men. And that is oh, my problem I'm, I'm totally right there. opposed to it, except there are cases. Well, I'm, I'm sure I'll be killed for saying this because everyone's required to lie all the time. I've noticed in America right now. But again, that is sometimes a symptom of age. And I, you know. I don't know what I think. I should probably t stop talking, I guess. Ashley, thank you uh, for joining us. <laughs> thank you, Tucker. Schools across America are trying to ban kids from having best friends because that's exclusive and therefore dangerous. But do we really need a ban on busybody social engineers tampering in the lives of your children? We'll discuss that next. Stay tuned. A follow-up tonight on a segment we did last week. We talked then to Barstool Sports founder Dave Portnoy, known as El Presidente to some of us, about his company's lawsuit against the NFL. Now, Barstool routinely uses the slogan, Saturdays are for the boys. The NFL promptly ripped it off for its own line of T-shirts. Now, the league was initially dismissive of the suit from Barstool, but since Portnoy came on our show, they seem to have changed course. Portnoy tweeted this evening, quote, I am happy to report that NFL commish has bended the knee to Barstool Sports and removed all infringing Sundays are for the boys t-shirts. We have conquered the NFL. Sadly, conquered maybe too strong a word. The NFL is still receiving billions in tax breaks to show spoiled billionaires hating their country. But a win is a win, and you take what you get. Congratulations to Barstool. Well, it's natural and healthy to have friends, or it was, just as it's natural and healthy to have a single favorite friend. That's what you thought. But something being natural and healthy doesn't mean that somebody won't find a way to ban it. In a recent article, psychologist Barbara Greenberg endorsed efforts by schools in this country and in Europe to abolish best friends. You can never make it up. She says the existence of best friends is exclusionary, which of course is true by definition, and causes emotional distress. Nell Daly is a psychotherapist and she joins us tonight. Nell, thanks for coming on. Hi, thank you, Tucker. Thanks for having me. So this is what, <laughs> this, I want to take this seriously because the things that you laugh at are the things that become federal law, you know, before you know it. Um, right, But right. having a best friend is by definition exclusionary, right? You're choosing one among many. But that doesn't yes. make it bad. I mean, marriage is also exclusionary unless it's, plural marriage. And that's not right. bad either. So exclusionary isn't always bad. Why is having a best friend bad? 
Well, I think what's happening in the trend across America, both in public and private schools and in Europe and in Canada, is that many schools are starting to adopt or mandate that children have certain behaviors in schools, certain policies, behavioral po policies, for lack of a better word. And it's meant to teach kids to be um, polite to one another. It's meant to teach manners. It's meant to encourage diversity and tolerance. And the the people who are against this kind of best friend policy are people who believe that it's not teaching children how to deal with negative social anxiety. Right. You know, the negative feelings that children would feel if they are excluded. Um, I okay. think the magic place here is actually someplace in the middle. Well, wouldn't, why wouldn't the magic place just being stay out of it and kind of teach like English and history and math? I hear, I totally hear what you're saying. You know, many schools now have a no to, no tolerance to bullying policy on their books. Right. I mean, both public and private schools. So it's a way to encourage children to be nice to each other. It's a way mm -hmm. to encourage manners, um, for well, lack I'm of a totally better word. I'm totally for that. But, but isn't, I wonder, and I, I, let me just say, I'm totally for that. I'm, I'm completely for tolerance and good manners. Yeah. I have no I idea mean, anybody, what diversity any, yeah, means. Anybody's for I'm compassion sure for and too. kindness. Sure. But it does seem like, it doesn't seem like it is a form of insidious social control to try and tell other people who to be friends with. I mean, who would want to tell someone who to be friends with in the first place? Do you think it's a little weird? Well, I think what's happening, I don't necessarily think they're telling kids which friends they can have and which they can't. They're encouraging kids to have larger friend groups. The problem with it is that the University of Virginia did a study where they found, and they published this in Child Development, which they found that kids who did have best friends grew up to have uh, higher rates of more positive mental health as they became adults, yeah. and they also had less social anxiety. So that's the argument against this sort of behavioral policy that a lot of schools are mandating. We need to teach children to deal with negative feelings, right? If we, if we numb the exactly. dark, we also numb the light. But we also need to teach children that everyone belongs. You don't want to make any child ever feel unworthy or give them a sense of unbelonging in any kind of community. So I right. think I mean, there's I, both. I, I guess. I mean, I, I'm totally opposed to <laughs> meanness and bullying, obviously. Yeah. And I am. I yeah, mean that. Yeah, of course. But I also think yeah. these issues are enormously complex, and the kind of people who teach school probably not equipped to handle these issues better than, say, the parents of the child. And I guess as a parent, I resent the idea that someone I hired to teach my kids facts is intruding into really personal questions like who you're friends with or how many friends you have. Like, why don't they stay out of that stuff completely? Well, I wish that all kids were didn't have any sort of behavioral issues in schools. But as someone who's worked in the school system, kids do. So... Uh, oftentimes, teachers are put in the position of having to help children learn how to modify and control their behavior. So they do have certain policies on the books. Like, you can't just have a bully running rampant in your elementary but, school. But, I mean, having a but, best friend is not the same. As, I mean, let's not conflate the terms. It's not the same. If you really sure. want to spend all your time with one person, that's not the same as bullying other people. What would be the remedy telling a kid you have to have more friends? Or how would you fix something like this? I think that they're trying to avoid children having cliques. So what they do is they try to get children to play with larger groups of kids and, and sort of run in larger packs with each other. Um, the, the thing that's really interesting here is that we can teach, we can have this in schools, and then at home we can definitely encourage kids, and we should encourage kids to have really close interpersonal relationships with each other. Not only is it good for their health, but as you said, I think it models a healthy family unit moving forward as well. Yeah. Last question really quick. It used to yeah, be you sure. kind of taught the kids in the classroom and then you sort of let them go outside. And as long as there was no gunfire, you, you kind of didn't get involved. Why was that a bad idea, that model? I don't think it was a bad idea, but I think that times have changed. And the reality yeah, is that I grew you know, up. <laughs> I live in a community that's not so far from Newtown. So unfortunately, you know, bad things 